real sustenance. And again, it depending uh, and depending on on the person that used to supply the guy used to dish out the soup. If you got the soup from the top, you got just water. If you got it from the bottom, you got some sustenance. But I want to just concentrate a little bit on the of the actual administration of the camp. And the camp was made up of a Jewish administration. The head of the administration was a woman, a Jewish woman, and her name was Pani Markovicova. She was Komandantka. She wasn't the Lager Elteste. We used to call her Komandantka. And she, before the war, was a religious teacher in charge of a women's school, a seminary, where religious girls were being taught. But somehow during the war things get a bit crazy. So she uh, came in and she brought, she was allowed to bring, she came originally because that camp was, was formed very early and the people from the surrounding area were brought there and they were the administrators, administrators of the camp. In other words, the, the, the guards and the commanders were the overall uh, lords, but they were the internal administration. So we had Jewish police who wore hats like you see in Schindler's Litz, you know, these police caps, and they had bands, special bands uh, around them, they, and they all had a, a, a truncheon, which they sometimes used to beat you quite badly if you didn't run quickly enough. And so they were the actual security of it. They used to take you to work, bring you back to work. They used to dish out the soup, and if they didn't like you, you got the water from the top, and if they liked you or you, they were kind to you sometimes or often you got the stuff from the bottom. And then when you came back from work, after working for 12 hours, and sometimes longer, depending on the whim of your Vorarbeiter, which means the, the, the foreman, um, you got a soup again, the same kind of, you know, soup, or kava, not always the same. And you got bread. That's the only time you got bread. And the bread was really very poor quality. It was full of God knows what inside. And depending on the whim of the commander, of the German commander of the camp, his name was Schultz. He was a, a not an assessment. He was a inspector of police from Vienna who had been wounded in the, second, in the First World War. He had one hand, uh, artificial hand, because he was wounded. And I suppose that was his... Uh, 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 he, he, he volunteered to be, a, to, and he was a commander of our, of our of our camp. And so it was either divided by 12, or by 8, or by 15, but never more than by 8. So you got a small piece of bread, and that was your sustenance for the whole day, day in, day out, and nothing else. Occasionally, when there was a kind of German holiday or something special happened, or they had some head, head people coming from the Hassak uh, quarters and they wanted to make the, we had to kind of make everything nice and, and so forth and so on, we would get some margarine and maybe a piece of sausage for that particular day. And the work in that camp was, was quite horrific in the sense that there was a writer who was, came from Maidanek together in my transport his name was Mordechai Strigler, and after the war, he survived the war, and after the war he wrote a series of books about these three camps that were in Skarzysko. And he called these camps Oiske Brente Licht, Burned Out Candles, Die Fabriken von Teut, it was in Yiddish, in the factories of death. So he, you can imagine, you know, the descriptions that he gave. Because most of the time people were dying there like flies. I want to share with you a couple of experiences that I had personally. I was very fortunate. And I was very fortunate that soon after I arrived, the, one of the policemen, whose name was, whose name was Katz, um, recognized my name and he was from Wuj, he came, they were transferred from, from Wuj to Skarzysko Kamienne. He knew my family <laughs> and 
he approached me. I was in his uh, commando. I actually worked, went to work with him. He was in, my, in charge of my command, my uh, commando. And he approached me and he said to me that his wife is dying of TP because policemen, administra the administrators of the camp were allowed to have their wives. They had separate barracks. They, they used to get good food. They were well looked after by the Germans. And also, I must mention, the majority of the guards in our camp were Ukrainian collaborators, SS, who joined the SS, and they were most of the guards surrounding uh, um, the camp. And he approached me if, that I should look after his wife. In other words, when I come home back from, you know, back to the barrack from work, I should wash her and I should uh, change her clothes, uh, wash her soiled, uh, the, the, the sheets and so forth so on, wash her uh, with the clothes that she wore because she used to soil herself and she, she used to, you know, she used to cough blood. She was a very sick woman and I would also feed her a little bit and because he was very concerned he, uh, about his wife and he said, you look after her and I will, I will give you some extra food. So I was already then very fortunate person because every day I certainly when he was dishing out the soup, I would always get the soup right from the bottom. That's number one. And when we, when he was cutting up the bread, when he was cutting my slice, I used to get a little bigger slice. And when I was in his barrack looking after his wife from time to time, he would give me a piece of meat, he'd give me a piece of cheese because they were not short of food. The police and the, and the administration, the Jewish administration of the camp inside were extremely well looked after. They also it just shows you the schizophrenic kind of uh, existence that existed in certain of these camps. So on the one hand, you had this terrible uh, uh, people suffering and dying from Pikrina, from the hard work. And on the other hand, you also had a small amount of people living very well. And uh, Jewish foremen, Jewish policemen, and, 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 and the full administration of the camp was Jewish. Um, one, of, one of the things that stands out in, in my mind is, which I think is important to actually tell, is that culturally, spiritually, despite the fact that we, we, they, they tried to humiliate us and they did humiliate us to a certain extent, they never extinguished the flame that burned in our hearts when we were in a camp like Skarzysko. Because I remember Rabbi Kamionka, he was a, a youngster of 14, he became a rabbi after the war, he survived the war. He used to come home from, he come home from, I call it home, that was home, the barrack was home. I mean, what kind of home it was, but it was home. He would come home after working 12 hours, hard labor, and he would stand by the window and he would pray and he, rem he, he remembered the, the holy books in his head because he had studied as a youngster in a seminary and he would repeat them over and over again so he shouldn't forget. And then there was Lieber, Simcha Lieberman, another religious Jew, and many other people like that who never lost their spirituality. The women in the camp, they used to organize concerts, they used to sing songs, they never ever gave up. So much so that from time to time, the, the, the Wachmeister used to tell Markovichova she should make a concert for the guards. The guards are getting bored, so then we would organize a concert in the actual camp. There was sufficient, you know, strength, cultural, and, 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 and in, 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 the, in, in our human psyche that we could actually do that.